Hello, this is PJ Gubitina Policarpio with artist Sydney Kane, and this is Notes from OAD, published by Art Practical. Sydney Kane, also known as Sage Stargate, is a visual artist born and raised in San Francisco. Kane's multimedia work is largely on paper and uses dye, graphite, powdered metals, and chalk as emblems of impermanence and transformation. She investigates remembrance, evolution, and spirituality from her perspective as a queer Black woman. Her current work is founded on genealogy research alongside the effects of urban renewal and colonialism and threats against Black afterlives. Kane has exhibited throughout the Bay Area, including at Somart's, Berriano, Ashara Ikundayo Gallery, Rena Branson Gallery, San Francisco Arts Commission, and the African American Arts and Culture Complex. Kane's solo show, Refutations, is upcoming at MOAT. Before we begin this conversation, I invite you to join us in acknowledging that we are on the unce unceded traditional homeland of the Yelamu and Ohlone Ramitish peoples who have stewarded this land throughout generations. We pay tribute to indigenous elders, past, present, and future. In light of this time and our collective efforts to contain coronavirus, we are conducting this interview remotely, so please excuse any audio interruptions. We hope that you are taking care. Hi, Sydney. Um, where are you right now and how are you holding up? Hey, right now I am in Santa Cruz. I ran away here from San Francisco amidst the social distancing situation. Are you doing okay? Yeah, yeah, I can't complain. I mean, I'm across the street from the beach at least in the sun. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Yeah. Um, so I'm excited to talk to you um, again. Uh, the last time we talked was during um, my studio visit in February, and we had, you know, a really rich conversation. Um, I got to learn about your work um, and really see your studio. But I want to hear from you. How do you uh, talk about your practice? How do I talk about my practice? Um, hmm. Well, I talk about my practice. I feel it changes every day. It changes right now. Right now, I'm talking about my practice, being away from my practice, at least in the studio. So I'm kind of forced to carry it in a different way at the moment. And, but uh, just the background, I would say I, um, I kind of grew into the tradition of like wanting to become like a draftsman and rendering uh, faces and energy or what, anything that's like an imagined my imagination can bring forth onto the paper. Um, so I still practice in that way. Now I'm using more materials besides graphite, um, also powdered metals and gesturing, trying to throw in gestures. Um, so sometimes with drawing, you can get a little tight, but I'm ex exploring other, other ways that's just a little bit more um, kind of like when you're you know, kind of young and you find more and more materials and you say oh what does this do with this thing so you know we're, artists are all chemists in some respect so I'd say yeah my practice is a little bit of chemistry <laughs> yeah Awesome. Yeah, I want to, um, I'll definitely go back to that and, and kind of think more, um, you know, especially when we get to talk about your upcoming exhibition, um, Refutations at Moad, and, and kind of the, the specific practice and process that comes along with that exhibition and that show and that body of work. Uh, but one of the first things that really excited me 
about you and talking to you is the fact that you were born and raised in San Francisco with really strong and deep ties to the city. Um, you know, I also have, you know, strong ties to the city. I came here when I was 13. Mm -hmm. um, but it's so interesting that you're actually away from San Francisco right now. But um, I want to talk to you about, you know, this rootedness um, and this sense of, um, of ties um, to the city, to San Francisco and its relationship to your practice. I have a strong feeling that it's really essential to the work um, that you are making and that's coming out of your studio right now. So can you tell me, um, can you talk uh, more about that relationship between the city and you and maybe a little bit of background as well um, about how your family came into the city? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I was born and raised in San Francisco. Um, my mother and her her um, siblings were sort of um, army kids. Um, and with my grandmother, they, tra they traveled around the world. And during that time, um, my great grandmother came to the Bay Area um, in like the 60s. And she still had, a, um, her other kids were, you know, still in school and grade school and whatnot. Um, so they kind of like grew up in, out here and they, they arrived from New Orleans. So um, them, along with a lot of other black families coming from the South to the, to the West Coast, um, specifically in San Francisco, a lot of folks came to uh, Fillmore and they also came to like, um, they also lived a lot in the southeast of the city. Um, or there was a lot of work over there, but also in a lot of other pockets of the city that we don't um, attribute black presence to. Mm -hmm. um, you know, all the way like hate. You know, they they actually moved to the hate um, the first time <clears throat> when they first initially came out here. Um, that was before like it was. Like kind of like the hippie movement really popped off. So mm -hmm. there's a lot, a lot, a lot of black families. And even then, like my grandmother and them, they have stories about, you know, seeing folks come up to their doors and they're like, oh, can we buy this, buy this hot property for, from you and all that. And um, so, yeah, nonetheless, like my folks are still here. My folks are still in the city. Um, most of them, you know, people are still having kids and still having babies and still existing. So I think that um, growing up in the city and it's very like, you know, it's San Francisco is really small. Um, it's only like seven by seven miles, I think. And um, it's, it's easy. It's easy to erase people, but it's not because you're, you're, you can see like the, Wealth gap, wealth gap, so strongly, and you are also able to like walk into different spaces so easily in like just like a different block. And you know, I, I I'm only like a few blocks away from like Civic Center, so you know, if you're over there, you know, like how how many transients are outside, how many like houseless um, people, and you're you know, you're, you're in another world and but you're also right next to like, you know, the UN building and city hall. It's, it's very strange. I think San Francisco is a very strange city, to be honest. <laughs> I don't know how I got up there. Um, I think there's, there's an awesome book called, that came out recently, like a friend put me on. It's called Progressive Dystopia. Abolition, Anti-Blackness, and Schooling in San Francisco by Savannah Shanje and I, you know, they're like, how they kind of like break down like the strangeness of San Francisco and it's a neoliberal city and, but also it's like, it's a apocalypse, <laughs> a dystopian in a way, you know what I mean? So, yeah, that's not, that's yeah. not what I'm thinking. Thank you. Um, you know, I want to go back just um, around that 
you know, the erasure that you talk about and, um, and, and the violence um, of this erasure, um, you know, from our last conversation, I think, um, and I'm also guilty of this, you know, people kind of, you know, look into statistics and numbers and graphs and, and numbers that, you know, that speak of population, but can also actually erase, right, erase life and erase populations and erase history. Um, and I really learned that from you, actually, you know, telling me that, you know, th this is, you know, kind of this self-fulfilling prophecy, right? Like we get into this mindset of, you know, Black people are leaving San Francisco or Black people are, you know, you know, um, not here but you know that is you know violent and that is erasure and i really really appreciated being in conversation with you around that um so can you you know just speak a little bit more about that and and really from from you know your own experience um you know as you say people are still out here and you're and and people are still there's this black presence and black space um even within this city mm -hmm. Well, I, th I, I think like the, the, the biggest thing that changed my mind from, from thinking outside of like erasure was like, literally like my, my cousin's having kids. Um, <laughs> my cousin's having kids, my great grandmother passing, like a few, when she, she passed on, you know, she was still like a few blocks away um, from where I live, but my aunt lives on the same block. Um, <clears throat> but it's also just like living, um, where I, where I grew up on the, on that block, literally seeing like the landscape, uh, maybe not the landscape, but like the, the, the place and the feeling of the space like change over time. Like I literally just watched like a whole neighborhood. I don't want to say destroyed, but I mean, in, in a lot of ways, yeah. <clears throat> a whole neighborhood try to become erased, you know what I mean? Um, it went from, you know, the Mo to like Hayes Valley slash like this whole center where people go to. Um, like people did not used to walk down my block. They used to walk down where up the street, um, white folks, even black people to a degree, you know what I mean? Um, so I watched that whole thing change and it's like, it's scary because it's like, oh, who's next? What's next? Um, I mean, I don't know if you know about, you know, Iris Canada and, you know, she was like, how old was she? I forget, like, I want to say in her 90s, but I also want to say like, she was about to kind of hunt it. Um, I can't remember at this moment, but, you know, she, um, was living, um, not too far away and you know due to violence like they kicked her out of the of her home right and you know she passed very shortly after so i mean people are literally killing folks over in this this housing situation so it's it's not even just about housing it's, it's something else that's happening it's a continuation of um of of violence <laughs> against against black people, against indigenous people, against poor people. So um, I'm watching this iteration of it happen in uh, the context of 2020. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so, and this is from, and my perspective of it, I'm coming from somebody who, you know, was honored to live in like a, in a flat, you know, um, and we don't own a home. But we're not in like um, we're not in public housing. Mm -hmm. Some other folks, some other cousins and whatnot are. But my situation is that you know the landlord is like probably late nineties, so it's like, oh, am I am I are we waiting for him to die to see what happens? Are we just waiting? You know what I mean? You're kind of just waiting, mm -hmm. given watching what was happening to everybody else. So I think that. Um, that shifts my perspective in regards to my art. And um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, 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 it's interesting um, to think of it 
um, surfacing in the context of 2020 and in this global pandemic that we're currently um, experiencing, you know, COVID-19 and, and thinking about any time there is a major, you know, global, you know, either environmental disaster or, or pandemic or any kind of, you know, disaster that it's always, you know, black, brown, marginalized, indigenous, poor people are always, you know, hit the hardest and, and mm -hmm. just kind of reach, you know, thinking about that in, 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 in historically and throughout different, you know, movements and, 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 and situations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, De definitely, definitely. And that's the that's the thing. Like, there's so many, there's so much, there's so much, so many stories um, that people have and that can be told. And I like to imagine, you know, as artists, we're like storytellers, right? Mm -hmm. and, and in some parts, we're telling our own stories. I like to imagine that I'm telling like another, like somebody else's story, and it's. Um, in this kind of like uh, imaginative way um, that can be pulled from the audience that can make their stories and understand it, but it's um, it's still always situated, even if even if like the the even if politics and the likes is not. Um, the center of what I'm talking about, it is still kind of still in the situation of like the space, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's still the background. Yeah, I think, story in this sense. yeah, I think, you know, based um, on your work and kind of the figures, right, well, um, the, that emerges or that comes out of, of your work, out of you know, your dreams out of your imaginations and out of, you know, kind of the need to um, make, you know, make these figures visible. I think the stories that they carry, like you said, are around, are, you know, are in the work, you know, the, the social, the political, and the whole environment. And, 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 you know, they carry with them kind of bodily and physically. Um, which, you know, I want to talk a little bit now into the work and into the exhibition. So tell me about refutations and kind of the ideas that, you know, you are, are thinking and bringing to the fore um, with this exhibition, which I know is installed, but, you know, is, is on the way, is coming up um, and uh -huh. definitely we'll, we'll, we'll keep you posted um, at MOAD. But um, yeah, tell us, kind of walk us through this mm -hmm. exhibition, this, you know, this moment. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so, reputations is, it's a, it's a sort of a confirmation of like, confirmation and also a story of me trying to dig out dig out that that idea that I um the fear of non-existence I guess you could say yeah trying to excavate it and maybe like I guess just mute it mutate it like manipulate that idea manipulate the idea that one doesn't exist mm. and it's a yeah so it's a challenge I'm refuting the I the belief that um, my existence doesn't mean anything. I'm mm. refuting the idea that, um, or the propaganda that says that I'm not here, that I don't matter. I'm refuting the idea that I am only destined for a traumatic death. That, and um, that's what reputations is as a whole. It is also... The body of work at MOAD is the, be the beginning of that. There's actually multiple bodies of work within that body of work. It is, um, it's almost like, so for me right now, it's almost like, um, like say for instance, like funk, like funk 
there's so much under funk. You can do anything with funk. Like, um, there's like music, there's the, the way you are, like there's, and everything comes from that. It's a, it's a change of, of mind. It's a shifting your, um, your world view in a sense. So for me, that's what Reputations is. Um, I actually took it from Diggable, Diggable Planets. I knew Reputation, as I was saying. <laughs> you know, music teaches you shit, right? Uh, so I learned that word a, some years ago. I got a new word learned, so yeah. I love that um, reputations is sort of, um, you know, uh, a mission statement as, as sort of, you know, this, all of these things, all of this body of work, all of this practice, um, the drawings, the archival research, you know, the, the various things, the publications, the 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 lithographs all fall under this banner of refuting, mm -hmm. right? Refuting the non-existence, you know, it's not even erasure, right? Mm -hmm. It's also the non-existence. Um, so, um, which I think is, is inherently connected to this history, right? Mm -hmm. um, of um, Black life, Black space in San Francisco, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I want to talk, um, I want to just go back a little bit um, into uh, some of the, the process and, and some of the, the work, you know, the process that you do in terms of excavation um, mm -hmm. and, and finding these um, figures and, and speaking through these figures. So, um, yeah, walk us through kind of the process of excavating these these figures and books. All right. Well, I'll, I'll start. I'll start off by saying this. Um, being picky now. Um, okay. <laughs> um, I say, well, I work mostly like reductive, so I like I like that you're using the word excavate. You know. Um, yeah, I like I like the word that that word because I don't I can kind of see like a silhouette sometimes about on like what I want to draw, um, but I for the most part I don't really work from like sometimes I work from sources but not all the time. Sometimes it backfires because then I get stuck and I'm like I don't know how to draw a hand doing this, <laughs> but I know that this. This figure wants this hand holding something, so I'm just like, okay, well, let me give the illusion that I know how to draw. <laughs> it's like totally um, opposite of what I'm taught in in school, right? Is that you need to, you know, know how to draw that hand, um, which I think kind of like is still part of the practice, right? So anyway, um, I'm working mostly deductively. Uh, starting from like a pool of like this dark substance, mostly graphite sometimes, um, other metals such as like the steel, like uh, the powdered steel. Um, I'm also dyeing the paper beforehand, cotton rag. So it's like really thick and it can just withstand a lot of like moving around and and getting torn up and whatnot. So I, I like to think of the of this stuff as um as the everything that's living. You know, so that don't treat your work too preciously. <laughs> you know, you can make something else and also just allowing it to live or to like kind of decay. Um I like I imagine over time that the work will decay. That's what I'm thinking of as well. And like the the fact that these materials also will continue to go through metamorphosis and change. You know, I think that as artists, we're told to like, kind of like really, really coddle our work as investments rather than things that live, um, our pieces, um, which has made it difficult sometimes as an artist <laughs> to vibe, but it's important to me because the people who come through the work also have something to say. Mm. They also want to transition. They also want to continue the fact that they are being, you know, they can't be detained. 
you know, some of these folks have been detained and why continue that in this realm of art making is sort of beyond me, but that's that's for another day, it's for an essay in the future. Um, so yeah, I'm erasing them, they come through. Um, sometimes I see a face and it wants to, it's just already there. There's, it's already there. I, I can't explain it. <laughs> No, I mean, I, I, I believe you, um, you know, being in your studio and seeing the way that you work and the process um, and, you know, kind of seeing the process, mm -hmm. um, you work in these large scale, you know, paper, you know, five feet, six feet, four feet. Mm -hmm. um, and then you kind of throw in, you know, all of your um you know all of the the graphite and then and then you know something emerges and and you follow through with that kind of you know face or figure um and it's you know it's almost i don't want to say magical because it kind of makes it seem like it's just you know but and i don't know like is there a word um i don't know like some you know people say spiritual or kind of really um you know other world, you know, worldly things that come up, but um, with the figures that emerge, you know, I think you talk a little bit about seeing, you know, the unseen and making mm -hmm. sure that um, things are existing. Um, and these, you know, peop the, these figures are mostly fictional um, mm -hmm. and sometimes often come through, you know, multiple ways for you. Um, but they, you know, again, they, um, they have stories to tell. So, um, yeah, tell us, tell us more about, you know, those, the kinds of narratives that these figures um, are telling us. All right. Let's see. <laughs> um, for, for some years, I, I was drawing a lot of, um, a lot of like androgynous, Corn sort of leaning to these film beings. That was the series, all right. Mm -hmm. And like they were, they were sort of like these magical beings. <laughs> um, I, I call them like these. They're like fairies, basically. Mm -hmm. And that series, <clears throat> I was imagining like what these little lights. You know, sometimes you see like a little light at the corner of your eye or somewhere in the world. Like, that's what they were to me. Those were the all right. And, um, and so, so their stories were like, they had personalities, like each one had, um, like some of them were called like the watchers. The other one was called like the givers or like the, um, like they, they all had their personality. Like you would call on one of them for any particular um, help or assistance that you needed, right? Uh, so that was the all right. Um, this, these folks that have been coming through recently, I feel like um, a lot of them have been sort of like feeling a little bit more mass to me. Um, although like, you know, not any like the binary, but um, they have, been a lot more bold i guess like their, their boldness is um like they these folks hold like machetes and hammers so i feel like they've been giving like this narrative of um they've been talking about like destruction and all destruction and also building you know to destroy to build your ability to do both when you have a tool and some of these tools have been, they've learned them or um, were forced to use them to build for other folks and to destroy them, like their own structure, their own. Uh, it wasn't, these tools were not always allowed for their usage of building their own safety. So now they're coming back in this time in 2020 so to assist us into building what it is that we need. That's their narrative. That's part of it. 
some of these folks. <laughs> um, there are also some of them are holding like briefcases, which has been on my mind a lot as to having to do with moving, um, migration, and, um, and travel. So that's sort of like them. There's also these these younger. Um, I've been drawing these younger folks, are these younger beings that are also on this other side of like um, in the afterlife, but they're still um, they're still living in their youthfulness. They're still um, playing that role and perhaps like assisting people to think about it, to think about the other side in a different way. Um, that's a little like a little bit more light. Oh, that's that's some of them. That's some of the people who are coming through, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Um, I know there's, you know, in your work, some people, some faces and some figures are more prominent than others, right? Mm -hmm. So they they might carry, you know, a specific story or, or a, you know, a, a larger narrative. Mm -hmm. But um, but you also create, you know, these large scale, almost life size, you know, figures and 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 a lot, you know, some of them are in groups and in groupings. Mm -hmm. Um, in large groupings and kind of really, I think, you know, insisting on this, um, this, you know, existence, right? This mm -hmm. presence um, of, of, of these bodies and, 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 you know, in this space. So, um, yeah, can you talk a little bit about kind of working um, in large scale and also working in these kind of large you know mass groupings of folks and and you know when you enter this space i imagine if if it's the same as entering your studio um i imagine it's it's entering this space that's filled with multiple stories and bodies and figures and and um and histories and and narratives and and you sort of feel you know you do feel a sense of large you know mass and and largeness and so so yeah t you know talk to me about that kind of decision to to create in that scale yeah i let's see yeah oh my god there's so much so much to say because <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a lot to say because it's actually a lot of um so much of it came from hearing people's responses to the work mm -hmm. and I learned how to go big and like the power of it and the, the work through parents and that's where actually mm -hmm. and I think the first time that I really like took like took, kind of took like a leap in doing that was with was at the Black Woman is God mm -hmm. exhibition and you know she said yeah, this is the wall. And I said, what? No, no, I can't, I can't go big. Like, that's, that's too much. That's too encapsulating. Like, I, I wanted to pull back. I like tried to drag people else in, into the, into it. And so like that first, that first mural with the woman, um, she you knows she's bare breast and um, she has, she's wearing like a red skirt and her yoni is all the way out to where like it's it's life size. Um, that's when I first really was like, oh, I can feel the power of what it means to have, to be encapsulated by your ancestors and to, or to burn this energy or whatever, your imagination, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that's, so then I started thinking about that more in my mind. I started creating these worlds um, I also listen to a lot of like music. Uh, Flying Lotus has been very inspirational, I think. And I realize he has a film background. So his ability to create a whole scape, a whole landscape, mindscape through music made me want to made me think about creating those scapes through art. So <clears throat> these scapes, now, some years later after that show, um, 
like what I see is this whole like maybe like room or the space mm -hmm. filled with um, bodies. Right. right. There's a whole nother landscape and I'm, I'm taking like snapshots of that space and putting it on the paper essentially or they're coming through the paper sort of just like um just like negative film negatives where you know the exposure uh yeah yeah the exposure uh comes out and it mm -hmm. over time you like start to see it show up like a polaroid so, so yeah yeah i think you know i think it it's really becomes so powerful when you see, you know, like this um, grouping of like five and, and, and larger kind of experiencing that and walking into that space and walking into that, um, that scene. But it's, I also really feel like, you know, the, the way that you sort of um, put details into one or two and really following that face and really allowing that face to emerge, um, but leaving others sort of anonymous and leaving mm -hmm. others being kind of less detail and, mm -hmm. and, you know, and maybe not give everybody's story away. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, t um, can you, you know, can you tell us a little bit about some of those decisions about you know what which figures lead you to a face and 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 leaving some of these other figures mm -hmm. hidden or obscured or you know or or anonymous mm. um well like formally i just i really like that <laughs> i really love when artists um and I gotta bring up names like that. <laughs> I don't have it on the tip of my tongue, but you know where where the the work goes in and out. Um, you know, and you you see it mostly when we gesture, like doing gesture draws a sketch, um, just like drawing something really good for like five minutes, and then the rest of it is like just kind of elusive and whatnot. And I I I feel like there's a strong power in just letting things just only be suggested and that's where like the power I think of the audience comes in like the viewer mm -hmm. and the viewer's relationship to what it is that they see um, becomes evident and then they start to fill in these blanks and I don't have to tell a whole story because I honestly don't really have it all. <laughs> um, I think that um, not everybody wants, not everybody, you know, is ready to come forth all the time or has to come forth in that, in that piece all the time. Sometimes I don't, I can't see them as well. So it's very hard for me to pull them out. So I give them a gesture and honor like, okay, this is it's almost like not knowing someone's name, but you know that they're in the room. Yeah. Uh, um, Maybe you like honor them by a title and just saying hello. Um, so that's 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 sort of why mm -hmm. I kind of leave some things, some people or some figures or things um, more detailed than others. And yeah. Um, another motif that comes through in your work is, you know, this idea of the gate and this kind of, um, what do you call this, um, the, um, the metal work. Um, and we had talked, you know, about kind of some of the sources for, for, for this, for introducing, you know, some of the metal gate into the work. But um, yeah, maybe, you know, you can just share, you know, this kind of family history and background of working with your hands, with your grandfather being a carpenter. I think it was your uncle who was a metalsmith or, you know, and, <laughs> and also other people in your family. So I just want to kind of talk about how that influenced, um, you know, how has, how has this, you know, kind of familial mm -hmm. inheritance in, enters the, the work or the practice. It's interesting because, you know, for a lot of us, arts 
has usually been seen as just a hobby. It's not something you make money off of. It's not something that you go into. But nonetheless, like, there's a lot of us who, um, our, our ancestors, our uncles, our grandparents, like, claim that, like, actually acknowledge that, um, I, that, that title of artist. And even when they don't, it's, it's like, the doing what you are and creating is, it, the word doesn't even matter. You know what I mean? They just live that shit. It's beautiful. And so that's, that's been the case with my mother, who was a seamstress, who is a seamstress. My grandmother is a seamstress. All of all of them. And although it seems like very, there's a sort of like gender background between, you know, like the women uh, sewing and the men doing carpentry, it's actually like very much exchanged. Like my, my grandmother, um, as well as another woman, uh, other woman I work for, Marguerite Brown, um, they know a lot about carpentry. <laughs> they know how to paint, they know how to, what kind of, um, what wood to get and all the likes. So, and she learned that from her father, her great grandfather. Um, so myself, as well as a lot of my other cousins have, have taken that legacy, you know, we, we embody that. My cousin, you know, she has, I grew up seeing her kitchen with like, um, in her living room with like pictures on the ceiling and on the walls and everywhere. So just being inundated with like visual, um, visual works, as well as my grandmother who is like a curator in her own home, you know. Um, that and also being a quilt maker like everybody does something with their hand and it's that story of being able to create um of being able to to fix things to amend to um to know to meditate through creating um even if they don't call it meditation like we know what it is you know um, I've been honored with the with that knowledge, I think, and just being able to see it um, and then share it in my own in my own way, in a different way. So I'm work. I'm I'm just I'm just following them <laughs> in a lot of ways, and then um, they inspire me. I inspire them. Um, yeah, yeah. The metal work. Um, Actually, no. Nobody in my family does metal. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, Wait, yeah. This, the my, my interest. I don't know where that where it came from. Sometimes things just come, right? You just okay. <laughs> obsessed with it, right? So I was actually really inspired by Philip Simmons. Oh, um, right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Right. Um. Yeah, and just like the tradition of blacksmithing. And people coming from across the water during the during, during the slave trade, and already having this knowledge of how to work with this this ore that you dig up from the earth that you melt down, use fire. Like it's a it's a huge like tradition and skill that comes with that. And you know we see metal as something that's indestructible to a degree, even though it still does corrode over time. Um, I wanted to start working with it because it, it lasts for so long. This is the opposite of paper. And <laughs> I imagine bridging those two. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, graphite is also steel metal. So it's, it's um, mm -hmm. we're so, I think I became really interested into it as well because we're, in a lot of ways, we're so removed from the, from those, from the need to learn those trades. Like we don't necessarily need to learn how to sew in order to have clothes on our backs. We don't necessarily need to learn how to build a home. We just, you know, find one or whatever, um, um, pay for one in, in a capitalist society. So I imagine I wanted to make these, to honor that legacy. Oh, we got like a whole slew of ancestors who 
know how to do this. What what happens if like all of that knowledge is just like pulled out of our of our memory? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I think I think it I think it's it's you know it, it's a physical kind of manifestation of of bringing the the ancestors right it, through through your hands and uh -huh. and, and through mm -hmm. your through the process and through the making. Um, yeah. I know that you know it's so um, from you know the way that you work you know the level of love and care um and thoughtfulness that you put into into the work is so evident and so clear um but i imagine you know that this responsibility of really being a conduit um you know as you say between um generations between realms and lives it must be a tremendous responsibility for you um how does it feel to to carry you know this this the weight of of making real and making visible these stories. Do you ever think about that or? <laughs> um, I have thought about that. It comes up. It comes up in outside of art practice mm -hmm. um, because it's also like a it's also a journey, you know. At least that's how I see creating art and even like having this conversation is is a journey, it's a lesson for me. It's a I feel like even though things change all the time and this I have to not allow pressure to um, to settle in because the the mission is there, right? The purpose of why I'm here, why we're both here, why we're talking. Is like laid out. The pressure comes from thinking about what other people think, um, or not even what other people think, but how it is judged. I do think about what people think. I like other people's perspectives, <laughs> but it's the judgment, and it's the judgment for myself that um, where I start to um, overthink the responsibility because it's all of our responsibilities. Like we really do share it. Um, we all, yeah. And that kind of lightens the, lightens the load. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's, I, I think I also feel responsible or I get kind of like anxious about it when I think about the realness of what's happening in San Francisco and it's like there's so many more stories. There's so many more stories that there are to be told. Like, what is this art doing? Is this doing enough? Is this, you know, like a lot of us artists have this kind of thought. Like, am I should I should I follow somebody else's formula in how to address the um, problems that are happening in the world? Like, I have to remind myself that no, I don't have to follow that one. I can create another one and pray that it it is useful for people, if not now, then in the future. And then I think, yes, that is possible. I think about people like as Bessie Harvey, um, even Charles White, or et cetera, and um, they've, not maybe have his, um, oh, I forgot his name, but um, other artists in the past who have helped me and have helped my peers. I'm like, all right, well, they did it, I can do it. <laughs> I look to that. I love, I love this question, um, yeah. this question that you had um, from your conversation with Pendarvis um, that I was just listening to. Uh -huh. I love this question um, you asked, you know, who are you when you become an ancestor? Um, and that's, um, I think, it's such a, a great question. But um, my question for you is when you think of an ancestor, um, or ancestor, right? Do you have a specific, you know, person in mind, or or are they kind of just figures in in that you sort of imagine, or is there someone where you're where you kind of see and talk to, like this is my ancestor. This is mm -hmm. you know when we when we have those moments to connect. Mm -hmm. 
personally, like personally, I think about it more so of like an of an energy. Mm-hmm. I think that the personhood, the figures, mm-hmm. it's a sort of like you know, anthrop- what's the word, anthropomorphize. Mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. the word. Okay, <laughs> when you anthropomorphize, so that I'm able to um, grasp the power of that energy. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, so I, so they're both. In both in a way. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's weird. All this, like the, the talk, 2020, we're able to have this conversation so out, right? Mm-hmm. Like, this, this wouldn't, this is, this is not, this wouldn't have been able to have happened like, I don't know how many decades ago, right? <laughs> and it's and it's still kind of weird to be honest. My um my my family for the most part are Jehovah Witnesses. Mm-hmm. And talk about that. So <laughs> so I'm also coming because people sometimes automatically assume because he's from New Orleans that like um that you already have like uh, open uh, acceptance of other forms of spiritual practices mm-hmm. that are non-Christian, but that's not a, the case. You know, we still, we're still following this whole colonization, yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, so my folks are, yeah, mostly Jehovah Witnesses. So I grew up, um, not discussing these kinds of things. So to be honest, like this whole practice is also an unpacking, a stripping away a decolonization practice of the spirit. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. So I'm still learning and I'm learning with people and people are giving me feedback and it's, it's bouncing off. So it is, it is healing, it's healing for us. Okay. Is there a specific um, audience or, or people or a group of people that you feel like you are making this work for? Um, the first group of people are definitely other Black people. Um, again, I, I remember, I remember like vividly the time that I asked like, what is something other than Christianity that <laughs> black people have practiced? Um, I was walking down the street um, around from my house and, and the answer came like that, like everything was ready to go. Like <laughs> um, the answer came off you know, offered me through a reading, the splash of the spirit. Sometimes I hate referencing that book, but hey, we all know it. It's real. Um, we, yeah, flash of the spirit. And um, damn, I, I, was, I was on a tangent. I forgot. I'm sorry. <laughs> what was the question again? That your primary audience, or who? <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, okay, yes. Yeah. So my primary audience is black people because because of what has been what we've been inundated with on how to live our lives. And it's been in a structure in like attacking our souls and our spirits, like, oh, this will happen to you. If it's not gonna happen to you on earth, it's gonna happen to you in the afterlife. Like how can you do that to somebody? That doesn't make any sense. So I so that's why it is for black people in that way because we carry that. And then after it's it's for it's for everybody else because um like I'm I'm gonna quote Sonia Clark and she said like the the personal is also universal. So once you get into that deep raw like personal experience, that personal experience, um, in the context of who we are here now as a black queer woman, then everyone else gets to follow that and learn from them. To grow, we all perhaps can be, you know, free. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's my imagination. 
Thank you. That's, yeah. that's important. Um, my last question for you is, um, what does it mean for you to be able to show this work and open this work at Moaz at this time? Yeah. Well, I'll be honest, like, I'll be telling people who come to see me, like, I got a show coming at Moab, and now they're like, what? Where's Moab? And I'm like, yo, <laughs> what does that say? But, like, that's the, that's the honest, like, experience of being Black in the city sometimes. Like, you don't know uh, a huge museum that is has African diaspora in it, and um, for, what, for X amount of reasons. So, I think... So for me, it is it is it is uh, it is monumental, you know. It is, in, um, you know, it's in the cities where I'm from. It is a place that grew out of um, wanting to tell black stories um, from the black perspective. I think it's. Um, a big deal when you know you have a museum given an institution that is going to supposed to honor that uh, your history but also your presence and that's the part where um where i'm excited about to say okay this is what's this one story that's happening now and hopefully it opens up more doors for other people to see and to share their own stories Excited about that. Yeah. yeah. Congratulations. I'm yeah. we're all also excited to to see it happen and you know, congratulations in advance because yeah. I know that um <laughs> it's gonna be monumental and tremendous um moment. So thank you so yeah, much. Thank you. Um thank you so much for being in conversation today. Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. This has been Notes from Moad with me, PJ Cubatino Policarpio, and artist Sydney Kane. Sydney's solo show, Refutations, is upcoming at Moad. You can follow her work on Instagram at Sage Stargate. Subscribe to Art Practical on iTunes and follow us on Instagram at Art Practical SF and Twitter at Art Practical. Thank you for listening and take care. <laughs>